All right. It is my honor to introduce you all to the new U.S. Uh, Great Network webinar series. We've been having this in the works for a while by popular requests from those who have joined our workshops and um, from those who are a part of the Great Working Group as a way to continue to uh, bring information and updates around grade, new developments, hot topics in evidence-based medicine and guideline development. And so we couldn't imagine a better way to kick it off uh, than to be joined by our two star speakers today, uh, Dr. Gordon Guyatt and Dr. Reem Mustafa. And just to live you, let you know about our plans for this webinar series, every a few months, we'll be doing a webinar on a variety of topics. Some of the ones that we hope to bring to you in the future include a deep dive on imprecision in grade, um, network meta-analysis, updates from future grade working group meetings, uh, GIN and Cochrane meetings as well, um, observational studies, really runs the gamut. And of course, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what we also we can present to you and what would be of most use to you in your work. Um, we would uh, like to ask that we would love to have you write any questions you have for our speakers today in the chat so that we can bring those questions to them and um, have a discussion after their uh, presentations. Without further ado, I would like to pass things over to my colleague, Dr. Philip Dom, uh, to int introduce our first speaker today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Good morning, good evening, depending on what part of the world you're joining from. Um, my name is Philip Dahm. I'm a longstanding member of the Grade Working Group. I'm, the, I'm a member of the uh, Grade Guidance Group and also a founding, a, a founding member of the US Grade Network that is bringing this first webinar to you. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our two distinguished speakers today. I would like to start off with Professor Gordon Guyatt. Uh, Gordon is a proud Canadian born and raised in Hamilton. He is professor both in the departments of medicine as well as the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. He is best known together with uh, David Sackett as one of the godfathers of evidence-based medicine, having coined the term EBM for the first time in a publication in 1991. He's the leading editor of the JAMA's User's Guide to the Medical Literature which has taught countless generations of healthcare providers the principles of evidence-based medicine. He has also for decades led a workshop on how to teach evidence-based medicine, which was instrumental for hundreds, if not thousands of individuals, including me, to become passionate about EBM. And last not least, he is a founding member of the GRADE Working Group, which first met in the year 2000, that he continues to co-chair with Holger Schunemann, to which he has made major, major contributions as once again witnessed in today's webinar, where we will be discussing forthcoming great guidance on inconsistency to be published in JCE as Article 36. Second, I'd like to introduce Professor Reem Mustafa. Uh, Reem received her initial training at the University of Jordan before going to McMaster University for what were to become her formative years to complete not only a master's degree in public health, but also a PhD degree in health research methodology and clinical epi. She is currently professor at the University of Kansas University Medical Center in the department. I apologize for this. This is a clearly, clearly a rookie mistake on my stake here not to shut off my phone, my apologies. So uh, Reem is a professor at the University of Kansas University Medical Center in the Department of Medicine, also Director of Outcomes and Implementation Research in the Division of Nephrology, Hypertension, and the Kidney Institute. She remains closely affiliated with McMaster University and has had a tremendous, has been a tremendous force in advancing grade methodology across all areas, but particularly in the area around diagnosis. She's a founding member of the US Grade Network and until recently was a member of the Great Guidance Group. And today we are delighted to have her here, not only as a co-organizer of this webinar, but also as a speaker to discuss forthcoming grade guidance on imprecision. Without further ado, um, Gordon, yours is the stage. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I will share screen.
I will go to presentation. Um, I will go to presentation mode and to full presentation mode. Okay, and sadly it was at the end instead of the beginning, but I'm now at the beginning. So, um, as Phil mentioned, this is going to be, this has been accepted as a paper by the grade working group. And so it will proceed to JCE. And before too long, we hope we will see it in print and everything that I'm presenting today will be accessible to you. So um, the first grade guidelines about rating the quality of the evidence were for inconsistency was 11 years ago. Um, published in 2011. The new guidance that I'm going to present to you today has two sections. One is general issues and rating inconsistency, study design or results, choice of the question of interest, relative absolute effects, target of the certainty rating, and the contextualization of I squared. And then a chunk on rating the credibility of subgroup effects. So starting with study design and results, and this was a late addition to this um, guidance. And I'll have to thank Reem Mustafa, who pointed out that there's often misunderstandings about inconsistency that would be worth discussing in the new guidance. So people sometimes talk about clinical inconsistency. It means that some studies have young or old patients, some have young, some have old, some have intervention given high dose, low dose, different comparators, outcomes measured over different times in different ways. And people see this clinical inconsistency as a potential problem. But in fact, variability in PICOs may be a strength that we can take advantage of in our systematic reviews and ultimately in our clinical practice guidelines. Let us say across these different PICOs, the study results are very similar. Across the range of patients, interventions, comparators, and outcomes, it seems the effects are more or less the same. This enhances the applicability of our results. What if results differ? Results differing provide an opportunity to explore the reason, and maybe we find subgroup effects that are enlightening. So grades inconsistency is inconsistency in the results. It is not inconsistency in the, it is not the different PICOs. And when we rate down, we rate down for unexplained heterogeneity. As will be clear, we look for possible explanations of heterogeneity. If, uh, if we fail to find them in the face of differences in results, we will write down. Next issue I will address is choice of the question of interest. Well, we're always concerned that effects differ across patients' interventions, comparators, and outcomes. And this raises challenges in the choice of a question. We can frame our question for our systematic review while broadly, a wide range of patients' interventions, comparators, outcomes, or narrowly. Um, if we do broadly, well, we risk differences in effect. Maybe we provide a single estimate of effect when it differs across our PICO. We sure, so to avoid that problem, we can take a narrow question. But a narrow question, we're inevitably going to get more imprecise results, less evidence to bear, and we reduce our applicability. What are we to do? Well, I'll illustrate this with age. So you're planning a review and the reviewer says, well, maybe the treatment effect differs in the old and the young. What am I gonna do about that? Well, what if you're really confident that they differ? Old and the young seem to be really different populations with respect to the likely effects of your intervention. Then you will have one PICO for the old, one for the young, and two at the guideline panel level, you'll make separate recommendations for the old and the young. On the other hand, when you think about it further, you say, well, it occurred to me that the old and young effect might differ, 
But thinking about it a little more, that's very unlikely. Almost certainly the effects are similar. And in fact, when I try to think about, is the effect gonna be bigger in the old and the young? I really have no idea. Under those circumstances, you would have a single PICO and a single recommendation. Thirdly, third possibility is you think about it carefully and you say, well, I'm really not sure if there is an effect, I think it will be bigger in the old or bigger in the young, whatever you think. Well, we'll start out with a single PICO because quite possibly the effects are similar, but we will specify age as a possible effect modifier, including, and this is very important, a hypothetical direction of effect. If you can't specify a direction, you're probably in situation B with a single estimate for both groups. Thirdly, relative and absolute effects. So it's well established that relative effects tend to be similar across subgroups for binary outcomes. For continuous outcomes, our effects are presented in absolute terms, things like hospital duration and physical function. For binary outcomes, although we focus very often on relative effects because they're similar across subgroups, we are also very interested and ultimately the patients are most interested in absolute effects. With relative effects being similar across subgroups, what will drive difference in absolute effects is differences in baseline risk. We think now that it's useful to have postulated in advance both relative and absolute subgroup effects. So here's from a World Health Organization uh, a recommendation about nirmatrovir and ritonavir for COVID patients who are non-severe disease. I work closely with the WHO under COVID guidelines. And for this one, we specified subgroups in relative effects, children versus adults versus older, time from symptom onset, serologic status and disease severity, and separately subgroups uh, for absolute effects driven by our the likelihood, we believe, that the baseline risk would differ across these groups. So next issue, the target of the certainty rating. And originally in the first article, uh, we had um, a criteria for inconsistency. We had differences in point estimates, confidence intervals, heterogeneity tests, and the I squared. Um, the, we did not originally specify the target of the certainty rating because it was only finally in 2017 that a paper led by Monica Hultkrantz pointed out that really we should be thinking of the target of the certainty rating, whether the truth appears on one side of the threshold or in a particular range. So the thresholds that we typically use are the null or the minimally important difference and the ranges, trivial, small, moderate, and large effects. And the point here for the inconsistency new guidance is that the choice of our threshold could influence the consistency rating. Consider this systematic review and meta-analysis summarized in this forest plot. It's about the impact of local infiltration analgesia in patients after total knee, not new, arthroplasty. The broken vertical line represents the minimally important difference of uh, uh, 10 on a 100 point scale. And of course the solid line is no effect. Now let's say we were chosen to rate our certainty in a non-zero effect. Well, every single point estimate except one is on the benefit side of the zero effect. And a number of them are significant. They don't cross uh, by themselves. Clearly, there's no problem with inconsistency here. The inconsistent results 
suggest, the consistent result suggests a non-zero effect. And this, by the way, you'll notice, is despite an I squared of 95% driven by the narrow confidence intervals, a point that we'll come back to in a moment. So if your choice of threshold is the null effect, no problem with inconsistency. But what if you are rating your certainty in an important benefit represented by the broken line? Then approximately half the estimates are on one side. At least one of them doesn't even cross the threshold of the minimally important difference. And a number on the other side, several don't cross from the other side. You have important inconsistency now when you're rating our certainty in a minute a effect that is either less or more than the minimally important difference. And so you can see that the choice of what you're rating your, your uh, effect in um, it can have a big impact on ratings of inconsistency. So the contextualization of I squared, and uh, I just pointed out to you that in the previous one, we had an I squared of 95%. And despite that, if we had chosen as our threshold the null, we wouldn't be rating down for inconsistency. So the previous guidance already noted limitations in the I squared. Small studies have very different point estimates and overlapping confidence intervals will have a low I squared. That doesn't mean there's not underlying heterogeneity in the effect, we're just unable to detect it. On the other hand, large studies with similar point estimates might have minimal overlap in the confidence intervals. And despite the similar point estimates and the large studies, you'll get the non-overlapping confidence intervals a high I squared. We will not have problems with inconsistency. And indeed, in our guidance for grade for prognosis, uh, we often have very large observational studies. And basically, the guidance says, don't bother with I squared. It's very likely to be misleading. Um, less dramatic, but still an issue with binary versus continuous outcomes. Confidence intervals are predictably narrower with continuous than binary outcomes. In a survey of continuous and binary outcomes, 352 analyzed for continuous, 557 for binary, I squared of zero and 34% of continuous, but 52% of the binary. I squared of 60 to 100 in 39% of continuous, but only 14% of the binary. A systematic tendency toward higher I squared in the continuous than binary, which suggests we should interpret I squared differently in the two settings. Excuse me, a lower inclination to rate down for a given I squared in continuous. And here's an example from a uh, meta analysis of finasteride for androgenetic alopecia. Um, the outcome is hair count. I squared is 50% might raise concerns of inconsistency, but seven of the nine estimates are between nine and 12. Other two are greater than five. Everything's favoring uh, finasteride. There does not appear to be an inconsistency problem despite the moderately high I squared. So finally, we've gone through the uh, five general issues. And we'll end off with rating the credibility of subgroup effects. It turns out there are 29 checklists to assess the credibility of subgroup effects. But until recently, none have met the following. None were based on a systematic review of all prior methods guidance. None underwent formal development by an expert international panel. None had extensive pre-testing. None has a small number of key items, possible additional items for considerations in particular cases. None has an overall rating that acknowledges that credibility is a continuum, and none have fillable forms that facilitate use. But there is now one that meets all these criteria. The instrument to assess the credibility of effect modification analysis, otherwise known as ICEMAN. <laughs> 
This is Stefan Schandelmeyer, who did his PhD with me before returning to uh, Switzerland uh, in native German, living on the border between the two countries. And he developed Iceman, uh, which you see depicted here. What we'll do now is go through an example of the application of Iceman. It's from a study that looked at whether there's an association or perhaps a causal relation between living alone and mortality. The review found 23 cohort studies enrolling over 62,000 adults with a follow-up of 1.5 to 32 years. Here is the forest plot. You see the point estimates suggest a 15% increase in your risk of dying if you're living alone. But lots of heterogeneity, some studies suggesting an increase, some a decrease. And so we would be interested in trying to explain this heterogeneity. And one of the things that occurred to us, I was involved in this, could the association differ, the effect, the association or effect, differ in the older versus the younger. So we're going to go through now the Iceman criteria. Well, Within study comparisons are much more compelling than between study comparisons. And fortunately, five of the eligible studies here reported within study comparisons for using a threshold of 75, one of 65, and looking at the older versus the younger. So the first Iceman criteria is the analysis of effect modification based on comparisons within or between trials. This is completely within, and that's good. And here's what we found out. In the five studies that do it, you have bigger effects or, or some effects suggesting an increase in mortality in the young, but not in the old. Every time in these five studies, it's a bigger effect in the young than the old, from very big of, uh, a, a ratio of relative risk of two um, to 1.1. So for the within trial modifications, this is the criteria is the effect similar from trial to trial. Well, they're all in the same direction. And I suppose it could be a judgment of definitely or mostly similar. Here we choose definitely similar. Also notice the p-value associated with the within trial comparison, three in a thousand, making chance a very unlikely explanation of this finding. The third criteria relates to between study comparisons and relevant here because we find five within study comparisons. Was the direction of effect modification correctly hypothesized a priori? In this case, unfortunately, definitely not. Does the interaction test suggests that chance is an unlikely explanation. And indeed, you've seen that the p-value was zero, three in a thousand. Chance is an unlikely explanation. Uh, uh, meets the stringent threshold of five in a thousand. Did the authors test only a small number of hypotheses? Well, we don't need, this one doesn't meet this criteria. Probably no one clear because it falls into four and 10. On the other hand, it's on the borderline four a priori hypotheses were tested just over into the probably nowhere unclear. Did we need, we should be using a random effects model for these subgroup analyses, which the authors did. And is the effect of a modifier a continuous variable? It is here, age, where arbitrary cut points avoided. Um, this one could argue about this one, but the 60 and 75 were, uh, where thresholds that people use for older adults very often. So one might say probably yes. So uh, great um, uh, ad advance, we think, is that in the end, you're rating high, moderate, low, or very low credibility, but it's presented in this way to make us realize that it's a continuum. It's certainly not yes, no, um, it is really a continuum between very confident there's a true effect and very and very little support for a true effect. And here are we went through the, the criteria based on within study, similar effect from trial to trial, 
Direction predicted in advance, sorry, no. Interaction suggests chance unlikely, yes, three in a thousand. Small number of effect modifiers considered or just over the border, yes, random effects model, and probably yes to a non-arbitrary cut point. Evaluating that, you can decide for yourselves whether it's high, moderate, low, and very low credibility. And the numbers there allow us to say that maybe you're near a borderline. The authors of the paper thought we were at the lower end of high credibility when we presented it to the great working group. They thought they were at the upper end of moderate credibility on different sides of the threshold, but basically the same conclusion. So in summary, we're rating our inconsistency in results, not in the PICO design. We have an approach to a broad or narrow question. You decide if you're confident the effects differ, confident they do not differ or uncertain. And in the latter case, you make a priori hypotheses specifying a direction. Binary effect modification is a relative, but we're interested in absolute as well, driven by the baseline risk. Continuous subgroup analysis will be on the absolute. We need to specify the target of our certainty rating and whether, for instance, if it's the null or the MID, that can have a substantial influence on our consistency rating judgment. For continuous variables, I squared needs to be contextualized. And the new guidance is that we should think about it somewhat differently if we're talking about binary or continuous outcomes. And finally, we now have a rigorously developed, uh, pre-tested, and uh, uh, very nicely presented, we believe, instrument for subgroup analysis, uh, ISMAN, which uh, grade, uh, when people are producing their grade guidelines and grade systematic reviews, they should consider the use of ISMAN. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was wonderful. There is one question in the chat. Ahmad is <laughs> asking, what is the rationale for utilizing a random effects model, preferably with regards to subgroup effects? <laughs> Excellent question, uh, which uh, reveals my ignorance and limitations. Um, the, in our, when we developed Iceman, we had some leading statistical practitioners, uh, international on our panel, who all told us that we should be using random effects. Um, they explained it to me, and perhaps for five minutes after the explanation, I could have repeated it to you. I cannot now. Um, all I can say is that these experts were consistent in telling us that we needed to use random effects models in this, in this context. Gotcha. Um, no other questions in the chat right now. I think maybe they're just warming up. Maybe, maybe a, here we go. Uh, should we use the same thresholds for gauging in, gauging inconsistency and imprecision? Excellent question. Um, I, um, <laughs> uh, inconsistency, you look at the point, the extent of the point estimates are similar, the confidence intervals are overlapping or non-overlapping, you can look at the I squared looking at it in a, uh, in, in contextualization, and you do all of this in relation to your threshold. For precision, we, uh, say, look at either end of the confidence interval and see if it overlaps whatever threshold. And if it overlaps widely enough, um, you might rate down two. And indeed, we have recent great guidance for imprecision, uh, which is going to tell us about the rating down for uh, two rather than one for imprecision, which we neglected the first time around. So they seem different to me. You have these three criteria of consistent point estimates overlap the confidence intervals I squared, uh, which will be influenced, however, by your choice of what you're rating your certainty in. And then for precision, the, your confidence interval overlapping your threshold. Where, it might, where the question might be coming from 
is unfortunately things get tricky with random effects models and random effects models um, uh, inconsistency will draw a lot of inconsistency will result in wide confidence intervals and one is at risk of double counting the inconsistency one in inconsistency and second in imprecision because the random effects models widen the confidence intervals and one has to be careful um, uh, when uh, you have an inconsistency you probably do not want to double count the inconsistency by raising down for inconsistency and imprecision. Now, not sure whether that was what the question is getting at, but that's a try. But Gordon, the thresholds we would assume uh, would be the same. Oh, absolutely. Okay, apologies, apologies for not getting it. I totally didn't get it. I <laughs> hope what I said was of some use. Um, uh, but yes, absolutely. Whatever uh, for uh, inconsistency, uh, for inconsistency and imprecision, you decide what you're rating your certainty in, and that is the same for all your judgments, uh, every judgment you make uh, in the course of your systematic review. Apologies. Thank you for that clarification. Looks like Reem's ready to go. Yes, in the okay. interest of time. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you for your support of this webinar. This was most enlightening and I hope we have you back in the near future. Thank um, you. It will be a, uh, it's been a pleasure leading off this, an honor as well. And I'll be delighted to be back if you want. Thank you so much, Gord. Um, I, in the past, have said uh, to my colleagues, I do not want to talk after lunch. And I also have said in presentation, I don't want to talk after Gord, because it's very hard to um, uh, speak after your very clear, always uh, enlightening um, talk. So thank you so much. Um, we will switch gears. So not only uh, in relation to the criteria that we're talking about. So Gord just spoke about inconsistency. I will be talking about imprecision, but I'm also talking about uh, great guidance in relation to test accuracy studies. So not treatment, uh, not interventions, uh, test accuracy is what we're discussing. And uh, similar to the inconsistency uh, guidance, this was approved uh, very recently, less than a month ago, uh, during the great working group meeting. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, I think the important thing is to highlight that everything we do in grade is based on work with many organizations. And um, it's very important that um, we keep these examples that inspire all of us to continue to develop grade. Um, uh, here are the co-authors who worked um, very collaboratively on this guidance, and I thank every one of them. Um, and I wanna just highlight an example, um, Ibrahim al Mikati. this is his first uh, great guidance. So there's always opportunity uh, for people to collaborate uh, with us, no matter how old or new they are to grade. Uh, over the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, I'll talk about the background, uh, the idea of establishing judgment threshold, uh, rating and precision and test accuracy, what is the guide, and then talking specifically about crossing the threshold and the idea of optimal or review information size. I will touch very briefly in one slide on this idea of the relation between inconsistency and imprecision. And interesting enough, this morning, I woke up to a message from a colleague in, in Europe asking, can you send me that table you presented? We need it. So I hope this would be helpful. Just as background, um, the first paper that was specific about discussing imprecision was in 2011. And since then, a lot has happened in grade, including um, we have now guidance specific to test accuracy. Um, we have uh, papers discussing the certainty threshold and contextualization, with the which Gord alluded to. 
Uh, we also have two new updates to uh, a grade in precision in therapy, uh, which were uh, recently published. And uh, something to remember that we now in imprecision have added the extremely serious level of imprecision. So it's not no longer only one or two level of downgrading, you can downgrade up to three levels. And um, we also um, have published uh, uh, about imprecision in network meta-analysis and I'm using we uh, very liberally. Uh, many colleagues have led a very important work. Um, we, we also uh, have um, used a grade in many examples now over the years about test accuracy with reviews and guidelines, and we're applying all that to what we're talking about here. Um, so let's talk about the idea of establishing these judgment thresholds specifically in relation to diagnosis. So as you all know, in grade, what we believe is true is that test accuracy outcomes are only a surrogate to people important outcomes and that there are lots of steps that happen in between the two and lots of consequences based on the test that lead to people important outcome. Um, test accuracy outcomes, what do we mean when we talk about that? We talk about sensitivity, specificity, uh, also possibly likelihood ratios and so on. Um, but also an important part to test accuracy results is the true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negatives. So when we apply sensitivity and specificity to a specific prevalence or pretest probability, uh, the threshold uh, for the judgment threshold should be based on absolute rates. So really, it's very hard to say, okay, the threshold is based on a sensitivity of 90% or 80% because it may be different depending on the prevalence. So it has to be based on absolute rates. So we think about the rates of false negatives, false positive, but also very important to remember the relationship or the ratio between the rates of false negative over all those that are negative and the relationship between false positive to all those that are positive. Um, different groups, can do a, a spectrum of modeling from very formal advanced modeling to informal back of the envelope modeling to consider the consequences on people important outcomes. So you may have modelers on your team who will do full analysis, but you may just say, okay, I we suspect that 30% uh, of people who are false negative are gonna die or something like that. So, and that, that this guide applies to all this. It doesn't apply to one group or this other. I think an important concept to highlight is when we talk about this judgment threshold, what do we mean? What we mean is that the maximal acceptable rate of false negative or false positive results that will influence conclusions for systematic reviews or decisions for guideline developers. This is not to be confused with the positivity threshold or what we call a cutoff for a test to call it positive at which the test is deemed positive. So that's so and really important to make that distinction. We also had to discuss in details in this new guide, the, the concept about the level of contextualization and does it actually apply to test accuracy? And here's what we argue. In test accuracy results, there is no line of no effect. Gord mentioned the line of no effect in his, you know, it's that line of zero or one when you have a forest plot, we don't have that in test accuracy. One may think that the line of no effect of test accuracy is a sensitivity and specificity of 50% or less because it's like tossing a coin, but because there is a trade-off sometime when that sensitivity goes up, the specificity decreases, um, there are tests that we actually use in practice and in public health that have a sensitivity or specificity less than 50%. So that threshold doesn't work either. People important outcomes are a consequence of sequences of event, including performing a test of interest, followed by a management strategy and a treatment, maybe no treatment and follow up or no follow up. So there is really, when you're working with any test accuracy questions, um, it's very important to think about this idea of analytic framework. Visually, 
on a whiteboard on a PowerPoint lay out what are the what happens to people who are positive what happens to people who are negative and so on it's very important and then the last point i want to make here is there is an inherent multi-directional relationship between test accuracy results and people important outcome what do we mean think about covid testing in the beginning of the pandemic okay if we had a false negative test, a false negative test affected people, um, the person's own uh, risk of dying because they're not receiving treatment potentially, but it also affected spread of the disease and affected many other outcomes. At the same time, if we think of mortality from COVID, doesn't only happen from the false negative, it also happens because people truly have the disease. So true positives affect mortality, and it will depend on that treatment. So there is this multidirectionality that we can't avoid. So for these reasons, when addressing the question of imprecision in test accuracy studies, we suggest that contextualized decisions are required. You cannot actually do with an uncontextualized decision. So uh, for that reason, we are going to discuss the threshold numbers, and we're not going to be using language like minimally or partially or fully contextualized. We're not going to use any of that in this paper. The focus of this guidance is on establishing judgment threshold. We may have one or more judgment threshold. Okay. So what do we do to establish judgment threshold? Um, uh, it requires value consideration for people important outcome. And I just spoke about the example of COVID. It also require the extent of these values consideration may vary between groups. So some may consider all people important outcomes and others may focus on one or two, and that's okay. And I think what I wanna highlight is a, a common example we faced is um, uh, as guideline uh, developed over uh, the, the pandemic, the threshold potentially for false uh, positive or false negative change but that's not because our threshold about people important outcome change, not at all. Actually, what happened is treatment improved or the, the, the uh, infection itself, different variants had different um, uh, severity. So our threshold about people important outcome does not really change, but you might have a change in test accuracy outcome when the consequences change. So, uh, our, again, this guide focuses on the threshold judgment, irrespective of the extent, how much you want to really do this modeling or how many outcomes you want to consider. Okay. We provide a slightly different approach for systematic reviews and guidelines. Systematic reviews may use a single threshold, and that threshold is when do we call the test accurate versus inaccurate? That's the threshold we use. However, for decision makers or guideline developers, they may choose multiple thresholds. And if they choose three thresholds, that will be consistent with the evidence to decision framework. And that would be between very accurate, 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 inaccurate, and inaccurate, and very inaccurate. And just to highlight, again, if you choose one threshold, you're talking about this threshold here. Okay. So now let's talk about what does the guide tell us. Here is what our guide says. We have a first decision is to determine the acceptable false negative threshold. If we're talking about sensitivity, based on that, we have to assess whether the false, neg uh, false negative confidence interval from the systematic re review crosses the judgment threshold. If it does, you're gonna downgrade imprecision one, two, or three levels, depending on the extent to how much across the threshold. If it doesn't, we're saying we want to use a, the concept of considering how many patients were included in the studies, which is a concept of OIS, optimal information size or review information size. And then based on that, once you calculate it, you then have to assess whether the sample size requirements are met. If they're met, you do not downgrade. If they're not met, you will downgrade one, two, or three levels, depending on the extent to how much it's not met. When you talk about specificity, it's exactly the same idea conceptually, but now instead of talking about false negatives, we're talking about the threshold of false positive, 
or the ratio of false positive to all positive, depending on the context you're dealing with. Now let's talk about examples of uh, uh, rating and precision based on crossing the threshold. So this, the next few slides will focus on this decision point two. Okay, example one, we have a systematic review assessing the accuracy of a VQ scan, which is a radiology test done to diagnose pulmonary embolism, a clot in the lungs. After considering the consequences on the test results, the review team decided that a false negative threshold at 80 out of 1,000 is what they consider their judgment threshold or decision threshold. 13 studies included almost 400 people found that the false negative rate when applied to the prevalence is 76 with a confidence interval between 68 and 101. Remember, our threshold is 80 per thousand, so we clearly crossed that threshold. And based on that, you will say that you have serious imprecision and lower the certainty one level. Another example, now using multiple thresholds, we are talking about a systematic review assessing the accuracy of von Willebrand factor multimer analysis. So it's essentially a test um, done, a blood test done to diagnose a rare blood condition that leads to bleeding, von Willebrand disease. After considering the consequences on the test result, the panel decided their threshold is 20 per thousand, 50 per thousand, and 200 per thousand. And when we did the review, we had 283 people in the review and the false negative rate was 45 and the confidence interval from 10 to 81. So clearly crossed two thresholds. And for that, this was very serious imprecision. We downgraded two levels. Here is a, another example. Again, a different test, the same test, but used to diagnose a subtype of von Willebrand disease. The thresholds did not change but now we have four studies, only 103 people. And when we looked at the confidence interval of the false negative rate, 103 between 16 and 212, clearly extremely serious and lower certainty three levels. Now, what are we gonna talk about? Let's talk about that other part, which is OIS or RIS. It is everybody, we are all in agreement that it is very important to address sample size in scenarios when high accuracy is reported, but based on very low number of people included in the review. I want to remind you, I'm not talking about a single study. I'm talking about the whole systematic review. If we only have very few people in all the studies included, that's a problem. And we uh, suggested the use of the sample size uh, for an inadequately powered test accuracy review, again, OIS or RIS, to inform imprecision rating. Um, it, it, this is really important because um, it, it requires the sample size for an adequately powered test accuracy review, again, not a single um, study. Users may use other metrics if they have access to statistical expertise. So it, it, how to measure OIS or how to measure IR, uh, RIS, there is a lot of literature and there is a lot of statistical debate. We're not trying to get into it here, but what we're saying is you need to consider that concept. And actually in the guide, we do provide an online calculator to help you make that judgment if you don't have that expertise available in-house. So now we're gonna talk about this decision point three and four. And here is one example, systematic review assessing the accuracy of telehealth assessment for the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment in persons with suspected cognitive impairment in the secondary care setting. After considering all the consequences, the panel or the review team decided that the uh, threshold is 50 out of a thousand there was only one study with 100 people. And that, uh, when we calculated the false positive rate, it was 16 with a confidence interval between 10 to 24. So the confidence interval did not cross the threshold, but we remain concerned that based on 100 people, that's too low. So we did actually 
go ahead and calculate the OIS and RAS using the prevalence of 40% uh, and using the pooled uh, specificity from the review. And based on that, we found that the needed OIS or RIS is 727. So with that knowledge, grade users may rate down more than one level depending on the degree of not meeting the sample size. Again, we only had 100 people and we would have needed a 700 to be more certain. Before I end this talk, I'm going to talk about this very important concept, the relation between inconsistency and imprecision. I must highlight that more work is being done about this. So more guidance is going to come, but we feel we need to help our users in the meantime. So this is what we came up with. In general, the width of the confidence interval is influenced by both inconsistency and imprecision. What I'm talking about here is the overall, the pooled confidence interval, okay? It's important to avoid lowering evidence certainty more than once for the same reason. We don't wanna double count. So this is what we came up with. There are different potential scenarios. If you have scenario A, for example, when you have the overall confidence interval, the pooled confidence interval is narrow, you don't have inconsistency and you have a large sample size, you're not gonna lower for inconsistency or imprecision. If, however, you have a narrow confidence interval, you don't have inconsistency, but you have a very limited sample size, okay, then you will lower for imprecision only. If you have a wide pooled confidence interval, no inconsistency and a limited sample size, you know that that wide confidence interval is driven by the low sample size you will lower for imprecision. If you have a wide, a pooled confidence interval and inconsistency, but you actually have a large sample size, then you know that that wide confidence interval is actually driven by inconsistency and you will only lower for inconsistency and the last example is if you have wide confidence interval and you have quite a bit of inconsistency and you have small number of people in overall studies, you will lower for both. So just a quick guide to hopefully help guide moving forward. So really in summary, we provide the guide. We give example of using based on the threshold or calculating OIS or RIS and a very um, uh, uh, you know, short uh, section about the relation between inconsistency and imprecision, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Reem. There is one question. Um, are you able to see this? This is from Martin, whom we know from our recent workshop. I'll read it to you to make this easier for everyone. As an emergency clinician, I generally think about diagnostic tests from a negative likelihood perspective because my question is, what is the risk I'm missing a specific emergent diagnosis given a negative test? Is there a way to begin by defining the threshold imprecisions in terms of negative predictive value and the corollary of positive predictive value? Yeah, thank you, Martin. Excellent question. And it actually it directly relates to the point I made briefly, which is we don't only look at, depending on the context, at the actual uh, rate or the specific number of false positive or false negative over a thousand people or whatever you've done, but a lot of the time we look at that ratio. Because, uh, and if, if your drive is the ratio, you will start by determining what is the maximum uh, negative uh, predictive value or the lower negative predictive value you would accept. And based on that, you back calculate uh, for the prevalence you're dealing with or the pretest probability if it's a specific individual and you will be able to make these judgments. So yes, you can. Excellent question. Thank you very much, Reem. Um, I, I have a question. You um, spoke at the beginning of your talk to the fact that you were avoiding the terms minimally contextualized, partially contextualized, fully contextualized. And for the first time, I thought when, when I heard you present that there was a core, is there a, 
is part of the reason this corollary to this issue of the terms double blinding, triple blinding, that they are ambiguous and that we should instead be much more specific and transparent about the underlying assumptions? Um, a, a great question, Philip, and I can speak to our thinking now. So there is a group of us trying to further work on that and, and put it in writing. But I think we're mixing two concepts. Um, and, and one of them is this idea of contextualization. So the truth is contextualization is a continuum. And uh, it's it's very arbitrary when we're talking about, you know, minimally and partially and and fully and so on. So just to explain to everybody on, on the webinar, um, uh, when we set any threshold, uh, I can set the threshold by deciding, okay, what is the minimum important difference, minimum clinical important difference threshold without for one outcome, without thinking about anything else. But sometimes I look at that and then I am like, oh, but they have a lot of side effects. So my, the minimum important difference moves a little. And sometimes I will come back and say, oh, I'm also looking at one other outcome now, or maybe cost. And, and, and that can continue to, so I, I, we, I believe, now I'm talking uh, Reem is, is kind of arbitrary, but then even more important, we've mixed one threshold versus multiple threshold into this contextualization idea. I think they're two separate and we probably need to clarify to the users the separation. But more work will be coming uh, on this important uh, concept. With, with two more minutes and nothing in the chat, maybe one more question for me. You showed us the table that looks as how to think about inconsistency and imprecision when you're worrying about both. It seems that the same considerations apply not only to diagnosis, but also for questions of therapy. Is there how? 100%. Um, yes, completely agree. Uh, there is uh, there is a paper in the works that will further explore this because the truth is we can't talk about the relation between inconsistency and imprecision and not talk about random and fixed effect model also. So we just need to further explore, but the concept is exactly the same for both, uh, but we're going to do more exploration about the types of analyses we're using uh, in that guide that is in the works. Thank you very much, Reem. Um, I think we're, there's nothing else in the chat. So I think uh, on behalf of the US Grade Network, thank you to you and Gordon for being our first presenters. Uh, Madeline had already spoke to that there'll hopefully be many more webinars. I think we have four more scheduled for this year. And uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, if you have, still have questions afterwards that you forgot to ask, please feel free to, to email us. Thank you very much. And that concludes our first inaugural webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.